Hello, this is Little Green Ghouls, and welcome back to Goosebumps Revisited, a series where I break down a classic Goosebumps book and any episode that goes along with it. I will also be totaling up some of our Goosebumps cliches and classic moments. This week, I'm excited to visit Be Careful What You Wish For. Before revisiting it this week, Be Careful What You Wish For was one I thought I essentially remembered, but really, I just remember the monkey paw-esque setup that comes with most Three Wishes-based stories. This isn't a bad thing on its own because A Wish Gone Wrong is a great setup, and Be Careful What You Wish For adds its own twist to the trope by making some of the wishes granted absolutely illogical and lazy. Yeah, this one isn't what I expected and not in a good way. When looking at the original cover, it's our only other non-Jacobus cover since Stay Out of the Basement. Stanislaw Fernandez illustrated this one while Jacobus was on vacation apparently, and I have nothing against that because it looks great. I've always really liked this cover because it lets you know exactly the type of story you're in for. Plus, I just like how pink and purple it is, and crystal balls are awesome. The 2005 version has Jacobus back at the helm, and the results are okay I guess. I'm still a bigger fan of the original because nostalgia just rules my life apparently, but it's fun getting to have a nice look at Clarissa. It just doesn't strike me as particularly creepy, and the move to blues and oranges is a downgrade for me. The 2009 version makes me think of Disney's The Haunted Mansion, with Clarissa's face in a blue crystal ball. I consider this one an easy downgrade, but we've established I just don't seem to typically like these later 2000s versions. The more I look at it, the less I like about it actually because this crystal ball is in like a fortune teller shop which never happens in the story and it just reinforces the idea that this cover is generic and boring. As far as merchandise goes, there's very little outside the usual trading cards. This one did get a special diary though, because I guess pink equals girl stuff. And some editions of the book included a special tear out scar tattoo, which is kind of fun. Our front tag says, it might come true. And I think this is our first case of the tag finishing this title sentence starter. The back tag says, make a wish. And it's fine, I mean, that's what this story is all about. Before we hop into our summary, let's read the blurb on the back. Samantha Bird is a klutz, an accident waiting to happen. She's the laughingstock for the girls' basketball team, and that mean, rotten Judith Bellwood is making her life miserable on and off the court. But everything's about to change. Sam's met someone who can grant her three wishes, for real. Too bad Sam wasn't careful what she wished for, because her wishes are coming true, and they're turning her life into a living nightmare. Now that we wrapped that up, let's hop into the summary. The book begins with our introduction to Sam Bird, aka Sam, and some asset named Judith Bellwood has just tripped Sam and sent her sprawling across the classroom. This class is easily entertained because to them this is just the funniest shit ever. We learn that Sam is in the 95th percentile of height and is the tallest person in her grade by a solid 2 inches. Sam is also a massive klutz because she still hasn't quite mastered how to control her freakishly long limbs yet. All of this has resulted in the unfortunate nickname Stork. She should hang out with Bird from Say Cheese and Die, they can start a flock. Judith is a master of insult comedy and frequently mocks Sam's last name Bird with real zingers like, Why don't you fly away, Bird? How about I fly on by and shit on your head, Judith? What do you think of that? Sharon is the first to ask if Sam is okay, and it turns out that Sharon is actually the teacher and that this school is just very progressive. We call all teachers by their first name here at Montrose Middle School. Brittany, Brittany. Don't call me that. We are friends like that. Sam then has to continue her humiliation by going in front of the class to solve math problems on the chalkboard. Sharon, why you gotta do her like that? Sam can't seem to write with chalk without causing intense squeaking, so maybe some of this bullying is justified. Thank god I haven't had to use chalk since like second grade. Squeaking chalk and even just the sensation of chalk makes my skin crawl. My second grade teacher Ms. Orbaugh used to screech the chalk on purpose when she wanted the class to shut the hell up. It was very effective, but probably against the Geneva Conventions. Of course Sam can't solve the math problem, so Sharon has to help, and it's noted she's wearing an ugly chartreuse sweater. I realized I had no idea what that color was, so... Look at me learning stuff. Turns out Sam can't do basic addition, and 4 plus 2 is not 5. It's 6 in case you were wondering. We ominously learn that things are about to get ugly in home ec in a chapter ending, but before that happens we meet teacher Daphne who is a big jolly woman with several chins and a great sense of humor. It's weird how these teachers just being referred to by the first names has thrown me off so much. Like I keep thinking that these are just very authoritative students. Daphne makes all the kids cook cakes, pies, and brownies because she just likes to eat them apparently. I would have guessed it's because she literally teaches home ec, but okay Stein, I get it, she's fat. I guess earlier at lunch Judith was still talking shit about math class with another zinger about how Bird tried to fly in math today. Sam hopped up to mess her up, but her friend Cory held her back before she could properly curb stomp Judith. We also learned that Judith and Sam are on the basketball team together. The Montrose Mustangs. Judith is of course the star player, and Sam is about as coordinated as a freshborn colt out in the court. We finally get back to the topic of home ec, and it turns out Judith purposely knocked a bowl of tapioca pudding all over Sam's new blue Doc Martens in a fake fall. Sam moves right up the list of favorite Goosebumps protagonists because in response to this, Sam starts to choke Judith. Yes, Sam chokes this bully. And that's when I lost it. I uttered an angry roar and went for Judith's throat. 
I didn't plan it or anything. I think it was temporary insanity. I just reached out both hands and grabbed Judith by the throat and began to strangle her. Judith started struggling and tried to scream. She pulled my hair and tried to scratch me, but I held onto her throat and roared some more, like an angry tiger, and Daphne had to pull us apart. Sam races out of home ec and we get some foreshadowing where she lets us know if she had three wishes, all three would be destroy Judith. I can't wait to see how this one plays out. This is all clearly before zero tolerance policies because Daphne just makes the two girls shake hands and then Sam returns to class, without even having to call home or anything. I'm not sure you can get away with like choking a fellow student out and then sit down for some pudding these days. Later, Sam goes to basketball practice solely because I needed to sweat out the frustration of not being able to finish strangling Judith. I really like Sam so far. Teacher Ellen is the coach and she wasn't very athletic. She told us she coached the girls basketball because they paid her extra and she needed the money. There are multiple pages of detailed basketball practice that I just don't want to get into because we've established previously sports aren't my jam, but the main points are Judith is amazing, Sam is clumsy, Judith calls Sam stork, and Judith knees Sam right in the chest and makes her black out in a chapter cliffhanger. Judith volunteers to walk Sam back to the locker room and Sam is too weak to protest. Judith tries to gaslight Sam into thinking it was an accident but fails and gets angry and uses her ever clever line, why don't you fly away bird? Why don't you get wrecked Judith? On Sam's bike ride home, she comes across a strange old woman in the woods. I gasped, startled to see somebody on this empty road by the woods. I squinted at her as the rain began to fall harder, pattering on the pavement around me. She wasn't young and she wasn't old. She had dark eyes like two black coals on a pale white face. Her thick black hair flowed loosely behind her. Her clothing was sort of old fashioned. She had bright red heavy woolen shawl pulled around her shoulders. She wore a black long skirt down to her ankles. Her dark eyes seemed to light up when she met my stare. This strange woman is lost and Sam ends up walking her across town in the pouring rain to get her back on track. During this multi-page walk, we learn that the woman is Clarissa the Crystal Woman. I don't have a crystal person because I've seen too many PSAs on the faces of meth. We end the chapter on Clarissa and Sam reaching the destination, but before Sam can go, Clarissa offers her three wishes for being so kind. The next chapter opens with, she's crazy I realized, which is the proper response to a situation like this. Sam politely rejects this, but Clarissa pulls out this red glowing crystal ball to show she's the real deal. I need to get myself a crystal ball. I just think they're neat. And I've always wanted one ever since I first saw The Wizard of Oz. For her first wish, Sam goes with wanting to be the strongest player on her basketball team. Lame. Wish wasted. Clarissa is unfazed by this. The ball grows brighter and Sam heads home. At dinner, we meet the family with the star being Pumpkin, who is shockingly not a terrier or a cocker spaniel, as instead just a little brown mutt. Sam convinces her brother Ron to play basketball after dinner because she wants to see if she's suddenly Michael Jordan. We're treated to more descriptions of basketball play, and it turns out Sam isn't any better at basketball. In fact, she played worse than usual. She suddenly shouts at her brother that she wishes he was only a foot tall, and in a chapter cliffhanger, a small figure emerges from the dark, and Sam's like, oh shit, I shrunk my brother. But nope, it's just Pumpkin who managed to sneak out of the house. Sam attempts to tell her brother about the weird day she had, and he blows her off. She chats with her friend Corey on the phone, but doesn't mention Clarissa to him. Instead, we get more basketball talk. We cut to lunch the next day, and besides some basketball trash talking from Judith and her sidekick Anna, the most notable thing that happens is two boys throw a pink haired troll doll at each other and it lands in some soup. At the game that afternoon, we get another set of pages describing basketball. This time it's a little more interesting though because although Sam is still terrible, she's technically the best on her team now. This is because her entire team seems to be moving in slow motion, yawning, and struggling just to function. The coach can only think to keep shouting hustle up repeatedly, but I'd be thinking we need to check for like a carbon dioxide leak or something. After Sam witnesses Judas dropped her knees with her eyes half closed, she finally realizes that her wish came true. She takes the time to enjoy this and enthusiastically cheers for her zombie teammates and figures it's fine to soak in their suffering because they'll get better by tomorrow most likely. But to Sam's horror, both Anna and Judith aren't in school the next day. Sam gets worried that her wish is degenerative in nature and that the two girls are going to get weaker and weaker until they die. Sam has a conscience, so this makes her feel bad. Corey and Sam decide to ask school nurse Audrey why the two girls are out. Corey hopes this will make Sam realize that the wish could have possibly come true. I figured Audrey would be like, no, obviously I can't tell you the medical information about two other students, but Audrey is like, oh, they're out sick with the flu for at least a week or something. In hindsight, I don't know how Corey thought either way this would make Sam think her wish wasn't real. Sam decides she needs to find Clarissa to get the spell undone, and since basketball practice is canceled due to all the players except Sam being out sick, she's eager to race to the woods after school. This plan is thwarted by her mother though, who has appeared to take her to the orthodontist. After learning she'll need braces for at least six months, Sam decides to call Judith who immediately accuses Sam of putting a spell on the basketball team. I love when characters in Goosebumps make outlandish but accurate guesses on the first try. The next day, Corey won't help Sam search for Clarissa because he has to help clean out the basement and Sam thinks this is a lie because who cleans basement in the middle of the winter? Am I the odd one out by not thinking this is unusual? What if I need to organize my Christmas decorations, Sam? Sam wastes a chapter and a half looking for Clarissa, but to no avail. And we get a fake out where she thinks she spotted Clarissa, but it's a random soccer mom instead. 
Sam is a glutton for punishment though and decides to stop by Judith's house to see how she's doing. Judith immediately starts calling her a witch because we did a unit on witches and social studies last year. Um, Judith, I think you took away the opposite lesson. Usually when you're studying the witch trials, you're supposed to leave thinking accusing people at random of being a witch is a bad thing. We studied spells and things. Okay, well now I see my lessons on the witches were a bit different than whatever is going on at this school. Judith screeches that Sam is a witch over and over and peppers in some flyaway birds too just for fun. This gets Sam flustered and she says she wouldn't have done it if Judith wasn't always being so awful to her. Oops, way to confess Sam. Outside, Sam shouts to herself, I wish Judith would disappear, I really do. And suddenly a voice behind her is like, okay, sounds good, I'll undo your first wish and grant the second. This is of course Clarissa, and I'm sitting here thinking, what did Sam ever do to this old broad to warrant the monkey paw treatment? She walked her ass home in the rain, is the victim of bullying, and now she gets tormented for it? I'd call this second wish good enough since the rest of the basketball team gets to live and only Judith gets taken out. Then I'd be ensuring with my last wish I won the lotto numbers or something, or got a superpower. Sam never learns from her mistakes and at home that night, she decides she needs to anonymously call Judith's house again to see if she disappeared. Stein lets us know that Sam had to use the school directory to find the phone number because it was a phone number she had memorized since she'd only called it once before. Because there was a time where we all memorized multiple phone numbers. She calls and is relieved when Judith answers the phone and doesn't sound weak or anything anymore. She goes to bed when she wakes up the next day she finds she's overslept and her entire family is gone. She races out the door only to discover there's no cars on the road and once at school no one in the hallways or in her classroom. It honestly takes Sam a ridiculously long time to figure out that everyone is gone because then she decides they must be in an assembly or something. After a few more pages of confusion and more attempts to contact her parents via payphone, she finally realizes Judith had disappeared and everyone else had disappeared with her. This wish is a bunch of bullshit. The first one made sense with its technicality because she became the best player on the team by making everybody else worse. This one is just nonsense. There's no logical way for Clarissa to interpret I wish Judith would disappear into something that makes everybody else vanish too because I'm sorry but Stein should have put more effort into how Sam phrased her wish if he wanted this result. Hell, I would have even accepted something like I wish Judith and everybody else would leave me alone. This is just flat out lazy writing. Sam sits in her empty house when suddenly she hears footsteps, which of course belong to Clarissa. She mocks Sam and says she did this to herself, when it's like, no Clarissa, you did, by essentially granting a wish Sam didn't even remotely ask for. If the parameters for what makes a wish are this wide, why not make up anything? Clarissa says she has one last wish to fix everything and reminds her to be careful, which is good advice because Sam stupidly just starts rambling out her next wish without thinking about the wording. Sam stops and realizes she needs to be very careful because this really is the last one. She settles on, I want everything to be the way it was, but I want Judith to think I'm the greatest person who ever lived. Barf. What a waste of a conjunction. The next morning, everybody is back into existence. Sam gets to school and finds that Judith has cut and styled her hair just like Sam's, offers to carry Sam's backpack, and seems to worship the ground she walks on. This perplexes her little latchkey Anna, who is shocked while applying her 20th layer of bright orange lipstick. I'm sure this will end well since we only have about 20 pages left. We're supposed to be horrified that Judith follows Sam around everywhere and wants to do everything she does, even if that includes getting braces. It's just so embarrassing. And very single white female. The next five pages are more of the same, with Judith copying Sam and ruining a basketball game by playing as poorly as Sam does. This book really took a nosedive at the second wish. I was on board and enjoying it and now I'm kinda just like fuck this book. This all culminates to Judith breaking into Sam's house in the middle of the night and scaring Sam while she's in bed. Judith is waiting for the next day ready to ride bikes to school and this sends Sam over the edge and she takes off and ends up crashing. When she looks up she's surprised to find Clarissa above her. Clarissa offers her one last wish since he's so unhappy. She's just trying to repay her kindness after all. Sam, who can't stop herself from repeating the same goddamn mistake, says, I wish I had never met you. Okay, you're off to a good start, Sam. I wish Judith had met you instead. Okay, now you're really fucked up. Judith is straight up cold-blooded because suddenly Sam eyes a tasty-looking earthworm and eats it. She then ruffles her feathers and takes off flying. And yep, that's how this one ends. Sam starts the book being tormented by Judith and ends the book being tormented by Judith, except this time as a bird. I don't like it. All I remembered about this episode before starting it was that Sam had a magical amulet instead of a crystal ball. Our most notable actress this time was Melody Johnson who played Sam and went on to be in Jason X, which must have been filmed in Canada because so many of these Goosebumps kids have gone on to end up in that franchise, and also oddly enough, the virgin suicides. Judith starts us out strong with some sweet basketball moves, watch out globetrotters. Well, this is abrupt. Less than two minutes in, Sam finds the amulet just in the middle of the court. Get into the game! Why don't you fly away, bird? Take off. Give the team a chance. All right, Judith, that's enough. Okay, girls, back to work. Free throws. Judith, back in the line. 
Sam had to do some real maneuvering to make this accident happen. Judith is just as witty as in the books. For a moment there, I thought the bird was really going to do it. To what? Fly away. <laughs> bird girl cleared for takeoff. <laughs> Samantha? This is off topic, but still basketball related. But my mind just jumped to that scene in the X-Files that freaked me out as a kid. And I forever associate it with bleachers. Hi, Scott. Go, Samantha! Scott Simmons, Babe Alicious in overtime jeans, minus the Brenda appendage. Hate her, hate her, wouldn't want to date her. Sam really is a bit of a mess. Oh, no, what? <laughs> the bird actually tried to fly today. She's as clumsy at flying as she is at basketball. I flip because it... oh, Nice lip control. I, I'm really sorry. So we're just not gonna acknowledge that Clarissa has eggs in her purse? Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. I... Excuse me. This amulet is a poor substitution for the beauty that is a crystal ball, obviously. Making Clarissa a feather enthusiast was a fun addition. Oh! Oh! <laughs> it was you, wasn't it? Oh, you made us lose the game! No! It was your wish! I just carried it out. This scene alone makes it way better than the books. Just leave me alone! I wish everyone would just buzz off! I love how she's trying her best to not accidentally smash anyone. Okay, maybe the fly scenes go a little long, but it's a fun gag. I didn't mean it, Clarissa! Not everyone! Sam! Bobby! It takes Sam literal hours to come up with this wish. I wish. Uh, uh. Right, I have to get this one right. Take your time. <sighs> Tell me your wish. I wish everything to go back to normal, the way it was before the flies, except I want Judith to be my friend. All right. No, wait. I want Judith to think I'm the greatest. Sam might be me in middle school. You're a natural. Show me how you do it. All right. Okay. Sure. Get low. Yeah, yeah, the episode really goes in its own direction with the twist. I wish that wherever I was, people would gather around and admire me. Yes. 
Overall, I thought Be Careful What You Wish For started out really strong and took a sharp nosedive right at the second wish. I think I enjoyed this one the least so far, even less than Say Cheese and Die. Maybe I'm being too critical, but that second wish nonsense ruined it for me. And having Judith worship her was really lame, and I'm surprised Stein couldn't think of anything more interesting than this in his shot at the monkey paw story. Like, the options are endless, and this is what he came up with? If any book needs a sequel, it's this one, just to do a wishes gone wrong story right. I'm giving this one 2 out of 5 sets of Doc Martens. Well, that brought our 5 star streak to a screeching halt. Well, now let's look at our Goosebumps totals. Be careful what you wish for didn't have any it's only a dreams, shoulder scares, or anything to add to the vomit count, but it did have a debatable asshole victim. Judith gets what she deserves midway through the story when Sam accidentally gives her a mysterious illness. However, Sam is kind enough to undo this, so I'm kind of like, do I count it? And I'm going to say yes because previous asshole victims like the twins in Monster Blood end up being fine and they're on the count. This brings our Goosebumps total to 10. In It's a Prank Bro, Sam was the victim of two pranks. These included Judith tripping Sam in the beginning during the math class, and when Judith pours tapioca pudding all over Sam's new blue Doc Martens. This brings our series total to 19 pranks. Getting Jiggy with the 90s had an increase compared to our previous book, with 7 90s moments. These included writing on a chalkboard, blue Doc Martens, another station wagon, Michael Jordan, troll dolls, using a payphone, and memorizing phone numbers. This brings our series total to 68 Jiggy 90s moments. Be careful what you wish for had less classic Goosebumps chapter cliffhangers than typical, with 6. A lot of these chapters ended on vague statements about things to come in the book, versus the usual, oh my god, something has me type cliffhangers. This raises our Goosebumps total to 142. The clunky cliffhanger award for this book goes to chapters 8 to 9, where she manages to confuse her brother for a small dog. Shocker ending. Our twist ending to this story is of course Sam getting transformed into a bird by Judith. This book is pretty unfair to Sam throughout it, so it's a fitting ending and stays on theme. This moves our Goosebumps total up to 9. Well that's it for Be Careful What You Wish For. I started out really enjoying this one and liked our protagonist Sam. She really got the short end of the stick throughout the book, but I really hated the lazy wish writing that ended up happening. I've heard people liked this one, so I was surprised with myself on how much I really didn't like it. Be sure to let me know what you thought of Be Careful What You Wish For in the comments. Am I being too harsh? Do you clean your basement out during winter? What would you wish for? Also, what did you think of my Wishes Gone Wrong clips? Anyways, thanks again for watching, and be sure you subscribe for... The Brad. The Love.